Right. Um, We looked at a bit of orbits last time. And we talked a little about the different kinds of binaries. So visual sourcing and um, spectroscopic. So it can be a combination. So The visual ones, uh, we can see the two stars independently, and then we can you know, trace their movements. Uh, but if they, if we can see them independently, they're probably pretty far apart. So their period is going to be pretty, pretty long. Uh, the eclipsing ones, uh, they pass in front of each other, so you can measure change in flux. And I guess the condition for that is that. Well, they are in our line of sight, both of them. The period could be long or it could be pretty short, especially in the case of things like uh, neutral stars that are going to collide or black holes that are going to collide. And they, they're moving uh, pretty fast. So the period is pretty short. And the spectroscopic one, we can measure the shift, so the Doppler shift in the spectrum of light. So we're going to look at them in a little bit more detail. So first we have our definition of the center of mass. Uh, Reminder. Zero. So that means that the magnitude of this one is equal to the magnitude of this one. So if we just consider the, the distance, remember that so this is the center of mass. We have M2 over here and M1 over here. Then M1 over M2, so the ratio of the masses is the ratio of the magnitudes, so the magnitude of the distance. Right, so if you don't want to write as many bars, just say x2 over x1. OK, so. This is the center of mass, and the stars are rotating um, about it. So, how does the orbit of M2 look like? It is not a circle. A circle? Uh, around. So it's going to be like this. Yeah? Oh, well, oh sorry. Yes. <laughs> Get it. It's right the other way around. Um, That makes more sense. <laughs> and M1, 
Yeah. One is into one that is going to look pretty large. Um, Mm. Can you look that? So really they are like tracing two circles, right? And one of the circles is bigger than the other. Um, but the this distance R. So this Minus x to minus x one. That one remains constant, right? So the distance between the two bytes. So, is it always going to be constant? Mm, yep. Yeah. Well, it's a definition of the center of mass, right? They are rotating about the center of mass. So you can imagine that they're joined by like a like a rigid. Yes. They are concentric circles, but they are you know they're gonna be rotating at the same time. No, I mean I get it like Yeah, it doesn't look like the doesn't look like the solar system. Mm -hmm. So I'm not drawing the time over here in the, the, the orbit. So you always have these um you can imagine like a rigid rod, right? You, uh, joining them together. So this is what is rotating or moving in space. So keeping that one in mind, how will this look like if you're looking at it um, in the sky? In the sky? In the sky. Yeah, from the Earth, it's pretty like because it is a binary star. I mean, yeah, that's the rating distribution. Yep. So There's going to be a line, and this is going to be the center of man. Of the system. And this is, looks just like that. Like if you draw a a rod with the two sides. So you're just gonna look at that. Of course, depending on the angle, it's going to be it's going to look more like a circle or more like um, I guess the elongated. The axes are the right ascension and the deviation. Have you heard about those terms? What 
How, how is it defined? Who do you know? I know, but it doesn't happen. This is kind of like um, the longitude and latitude, which is the Earth. But instead of looking at the Earth, you're looking at, I don't know how to call it, the whole sky, the whole sphere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there is you know, some definition, I think. It's like a dome, yeah. Hmm? <laughs> it's all that's what the astronomers use, you know? Not me. So I think, you know, they define it in terms of like the equinox or something. Right? So it's like some distance to the sun and how it looks at that point. And the declination then moves to, to the east. So it's a right ascension. And then the declination is kind of this, um, um, what do you call it, uh, degree of freedom. One is kind of like this, the other one is kind of like that. So because the earth, you know, it's rotating uh, about the sun. It's not always exactly the same. That's why you have to define it in terms of the, the dome as opposed to the, uh, the earth. But it's essentially space, you know, left, right, up, down. So your binaries are going to look like that. Well, what do you think? So they could be. I guess this is like one particular case, right? In which they cross if they are eclipsed. So if they don't exactly eclipse each other, then there's going to be uh, some separation over here. Yeah, so this is like the simpler case. Okay. Um, so X1 and X2 are look at that. Yeah, so the other drawing. So X one is the you know is the distance from one of the stars to the center of mass. It's also the semi major axis of the and the other one is the other semi-major axis. So the whole thing was 2a. So x1 is going to be equal to a1. x2 is just to that in mind. So, but we really um, measure, I guess what we can look at is, we can call it alpha one and alpha two. Is A1 over D, A2 over D. So A1 and A2, is this this these distances? Uh, this is going to be an angle, you know, in an arc length, and d is the distance from the Earth to where this distance 
is located. So, it's the angular separation. Okay, so keep that in mind. So we're gonna consider the case in which these ellipses are very close to the circle, so very low eccentricity. So if that is the case, we can define the centripetal force. So mass times centripetal acceleration. So we call this mass equals F1. So then it's gonna be so these are this x1 and the force is g m1 and 2 over i squared so this x1 is the distance from where m1 is located and the center of mass and this r is the distance from M1 to M2. So, so uh, uh, where do you mean like less than the distance? As units of distance? Yeah. Oh. Wait, no, no, this is, so this one is here, this X1. Okay. And this whole thing is R. Right, so um, this other mass is the one that is providing the force, or the gravitational force. But it seems like it is rotating about, well, it is rotating about the center of mass. So that's why these two um, are different. So we can get rid of the masses. One, one. In What do you mean? Well, it's, it's not going to be a, a circular orbit. So, like at, a, at any instance, this approximation is correct. Right? Um, but yeah, because these ones are moving, it's not going to be perfect circle. Yeah. No. No, they have to be the same masses, the center of masses in the center of the circle. Okay, so then this is um, so Weinberg uses omega for the angular frequency. I don't like it, no, capital omega. I don't like it that much, but I use it. Um, Work.
and x1 is m2 over total mass uh, times r. We can put it in there. I like to go up and down. All right, so now we can get rid of these and twos. We have the total mass here. So I can write this one as omega squared equals g m divided by r cubed. Have you seen this equation before? Mm, yes. It's the angular velocity. Sorry, this is a uh, angular frequency. Sorry. You sure? It's good on? Um. Oh, it's uh, Kepler's right law. Probably. <laughs> I'll be surprised if you if you didn't. So I guess we can also say That this one, so M1 plus M2, the total mass is omega squared R cubed over G. This is just the magnitude of the direction. So I'll put it to you. No, that's like in general, but the mass in the other one is just have to be. Yeah. This, is, this is the easy way to derive it. But the, because it's a circular orbit, but it holds in general. So that equation is easy. Yes. Yes, but you know, then this one is not constant. So the period, the frequency is going to depend on the distance, like we, like we did last time. So this is the, yeah. Otherwise, you need like elliptical equation. Horrible. <laughs> um, so then we had to write the x's. So no, we can take the alpha one and alpha two. So x two over d and x one over d. 
So these ones, we can measure them. Uh, this one we can measure it as well. So we can know what is the total mass of the system just from, from uh, looking at the stars or bodies. Okay. Hmm? These the distance from like where you're measuring to where this is from the earth to the stars. So this one is more difficult to to guess. Not I mean you cannot guess it, but how will you Estimated. Yeah, but you will need to know what kind of star it is to know the luminosity. You, you cool? Yeah, I'll give you an idea. So, redshift is another one if, if it's really far away. Um, not, not if it's close, it's not going to be redshifted enough. Okay, so yeah, this is one equation. The other one was m1 over m2 is x2 over x1. So two equations and in principle, two unknowns, mass one and mass two. So, you know, if you have a good idea of D, then uh, by measuring the, the period, uh, you can uh, separate the two masses. So what is M1 and M2? And you know, this kind of like, one of the most, as you can imagine, you know, one of the most uh, widely used equations in, in, uh, in astronomy. If you're doing observation. Okay, so the frequency in your frequency is 2 pi over the period. So that means that maybe can square. I guess the period is really what you're going to, to measure. How will you measure the period? Just waiting. Yeah. So you'll get your observation at each uh, time and you're able to, uh, to get it. So then the period is gonna be Four pi squared r cubed over g n root of that. Also, the mass is two pi squared on r cubed over g two. And it is like so this is the same equation you can have no both of these things. You can you can measure what you need. So the procedure interesting example. So if the period is one year. So 3.15 times 10 to the 7 seconds. And the distance is 
So R, the separation between these two bodies is one astronomical unit. Um, G1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. And most of the mass, so you know, M2, is much smaller than M1. Then the total mass is approximately equal to M1. Can get the mass. So, what system will this be? Earth and So what is the order of magnitude of this mass? This is like, this is 40. Uh, this is going to be 10 to the 33. And this one will be 14, almost 15. And this one this is like four. So about 10 to the 30 kilograms. Does that look about right? Yep. And I did it with the calculator. I got um, 2.0 times 10 to the 30, which is which is the solar mass. So, you know, it seems like a... Is that how we define? What? Uh, it is it the distance from, like the average distance from the sun to the earth. So, I think I'm cheating a little bit here because it is not necessarily easy to get. Yeah, but how do you get the distance? Yes. What it stands for? Oh. Like what? What is it? Right. But how do you measure? How do you determine it? Yeah. So I think the astronomical unit um, had in the past or it has been defined um, in terms of the gravitational constant and the mass. 
you're saying this relationship. But you know, if, if you just have to determine the distance from the earth to the sun, how many do you have? So I think the first people like in antiquity try to measure this or primitive. Um, they look at like shadows. Uh, you know, like they would walk from you know, Athens to Alexandria or something like that. Um, they they kind of estimated the size of the earth, like it was a good Piece of estimate. Earth, Earth is bigger than we <laughs> Not that, but the distance to the sun um, took much longer. So you can make a triangle. So I think the, I think they measure the orbit of. Mars. They, no, no, no. They they made. Okay, I'm getting confused. Uh, they did measure the size of Venus at some point, but that was afterwards. Um, and then there were, you can observe Venus and put the, the sun. And then from that you can get like the radius of the sun. Um, so they they use uh, parallax. From the sides of the Earth, like South America and Asia, or something like that, um, to measure the, the size of the sun, like the radius of the sun. But you know, a lot of the history of astronomy really is like finding a good calibration, and then you go you go from there. And you know, whenever a small correction is made to one of these things, or in this case, the sun. Um, the distance to the galaxy changes by like 10%. Um, just because everything is kind of based on other things. Um, but yeah, so actually, it's easier to measure the mass of the sun than to measure the, the distance. Um, but yeah, once you. Um, once you have that, then you can calculate the radius also. Uh, sorry, that's what they're trying to do. So then you can use that for the parallax, like to look at the stars that are close enough that they look at different spots if you're on one side of the sun or to the other side. Um, then from that, you can get um, an estimate. I forget what is next. And then eventually, you get the supernovas. There's another one. Okay. Um, so mass. Okay. So in the general case, if you're looking at the binary system, so this is going to be your line of sight. And you know, there might be you can define an angle. Between the normal to the plane of rotation and the line of sight, this would be one case. Um, the other one could be look like that. So you have your um, 
this is rotated like this. Then this is your, this is the plane of rotation. And this one is going to be the normal. And this angle over here is called I. And I have seen this notation pretty much in every book, so I think it's common. So if I is equal to zero, then you see the looks like a circle. So that this is a circular orbit. Uh, if I is equal to, let's say, pi, then how is it going to look? Let's do uh, pi over 2 and pi. So if it's pi, yes. so this angle is 90 degrees, right? So it comes 180. This is 90 degrees. Okay. Let's do pi over 4, pi over 2. Then this just looks like this, right? It would be a line. And the other one? Minutes. Minutes. And so the closer this angle is to 90 degrees, the more it looks like an ellipse. So then it's kind of complicated because the orbits are elliptical, and then the, the projection is also elliptical. So it might be a little bit difficult to untangle everything. But so this I is called the angle um, of inclination. So we can measure the velocities um, pretty accurately using Doppler shift. So remember that Yes. So you're going to have your spectrum, so you like like light, and you have some um, absorption, or it could be an emission line. So if this is right here, easier to measure. So if it moves to this side, so lower um, wavelength, what is happening to the source? Short wave line, so it's moving away. Mm -hmm. Now, the wave length, like, mm -hmm. yes. So, short wave length, more energy, so this is towards us. Yeah. 
this is a wave. So this is relatively easy to measure. Just get the spectrum and that's it. So then the velocity observed, the velocity of um, mass one is going to be v one times of i. This is the magnitude of two. This is the velocity of two sine of i. And both the condition. So the most useful systems are the ones that are uh, eclipsing. So i is about Priority. So V one is going to be two pi x one ninety over the period and v2 is 2 pi x2 over the period so with the period we can measure it uh, so essentially the velocities are proportional to the semi major axis of mass of one and two so And we know what V1 and V2 are. So V2x is 2 pi. X1 So the ratio of the observed velocities is just x1 over x2. And for the previous equation, this is m2 over m1. So the ratio of the observed velocities and you don't have to make any corrections, this is just the observation. Um, is the ratio of the masses. Is the observation has to be like from the Doppler Yes. Yeah, so you get the velocity from the Doppler shift. But you don't have to worry about the angle, because the angles cancel out. Or the sine i. Um, so it's one. V V one V over two pi. So V one um,
and same thing for X2. Let's do just two here, two here, two here, and R just the magnitude is x1 plus x2. So we'll get up here. So then we can plug this one into Kepler's law. So for the mass, so this is the radius, uh, this radius cube. So Q cube So then we can get rid of this period over here and this two pi squared over here. And so the mass uh, sine cube of i is t. Right, so you can get to know the mass of the system up to these uh, factor. So let's consider the case where this angle is close to 90 degrees, so they are facing each other. This is the lucky factor. And this is time. So you might have like this one, you should remember it. So for case one, you know, consider a system that is rotating um, counterclockwise. So we can have M1 over here and M2 over here. And the center of mass is over here. So 
but this was meant to be also to the heavier. So one is moving towards us and the other one away from us at the same time. And then the other case where they're moving like this. Um, so this is going to look Using B two sine of pi, and then the other one is going to move like that. So you're going to use the Not the average, but the value that you observe when they are over here, and when they're over here. And which one is it gonna be which one is gonna be moving faster? At any time. I guess except when they are precisely like this and we cannot really measure it. This one is moving faster, right? So this one has to be the lighter one. So this is called a radial velocity curve. This one, you will see it a lot in papers. Hmm? What do you mean if I? It returns to this one. It's a. Uh, so you have your two stars, right? And they are rotating around the center of mass like this. So at some point, because they are kind of joined by a rod, one is moving towards you and the other one is moving away from you. So that's when you have uh, these maximum or these maximum values. Um, and then they just repeat. So when this one is gonna be moving towards you, but it's more massive, so you don't see that much of a change as in the other one. And hmm? because there's no velocity in this direction. I mean you might have some the whole system might move in towards you, but it's going to be so think about it. Um, you know, as not moving, like the center of mass is not moving at all. You know, the distance is not changing, it's not moving in any direction. You just have the two masses that are rotating. So if they're moving towards you, you can measure the Doppler shift. But if they're not, you know, if the velocity in your direction is zero, then you cannot. You can model it, right? You can model it? Yeah, I mean the this the velocity should be pretty much the same everywhere, right? Like if 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 you're not observing it, you're just looking from the top. Mm -hmm. So this has like a lot of information, and if they are eclipsing, so if the angle uh, 
sun is close to 90 degrees, then this is the same thing, so time. And this is going to be plus. It might see something like that. So this is the, you cannot distinguish this, this um, system, right? It's too far away. That's why it is a spectroscopic eclipsing binary. So if they're you know, on the side, then you see the flux of both of them. But if you are looking at them like this, you do not measure any velocity, like in our direction. Um, and they are eclipsing. So this one might be um, the big one, you know, the, the less luminous one passing in front of the more luminous one. And then this is the, the other case. The less luminous one is behind. You still see like a lot of it, but not all. So this one is called a um, light curve. So because you know the velocity is over here, and well, I guess you know velocity is time of time. And you can also estimate from this, and this is time. You can estimate the, the radius uh, or the diameter, I guess, of the, the two bodies. So if you have like a single you know, lonely star, it's difficult to get a lot of information about it. But for binaries, you can learn a lot about them. This is supposed to be constant. Okay, so let's consider the case in which you only observe one velocity. In what case would that happen? Bring what cases? A black hole. That's something you can really observe or a planet. Or a planet, big enough to. They make a difference in them. So, you know, with these two curves essentially, is how they, they detect planets. So, um, like it's what Kepler does, or I guess the, the, the instruments, not the person. <laughs> okay, so This is just in terms of the velocity that you can observe. Thank you. 
to get in one of the two, this capital M. So I give it to I, and then this one is M2 plus M1 over uh, M2. This is going to be M2 cubed divided by the one plus M2 is the total mass. And you can cancel all the quantities. It's going to be total mass squared and sine cubed i. And that is equal to just this guy. We have the masses. So E one of third cube divided by two pi cube. And then so that one is general. We can make one more approximation. Um, if one of the masses much smaller than the other one. So let's say that n is about approximately equal to n1. Then you're going to end up with This M just made it in one. So you cannot observe uh, both of them, you can only observe one, but you know that the mass of one is much smaller, so it's a planet. So this would be the mass of the planet. This would be the mass of the star. So, with some patience, you, know, you can always measure the period. These V1 observe, um, I will just tell you the uh, sensitivity of the best instruments can get it to uh, three meters per second. So these are like ridiculously sensitive measurements. So you could be walking you know, on top of this star, or I guess on top of this planet. You will be able to detect that Doppler shift. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like running at your fastest rate. No, no, I mean, yeah, yeah. But maybe like seven or eight years per second. I don't, I don't, I don't know why the, like, why, why the phone is where we were, it seemed like the video was like maybe across the two blocks of the US. And they just like walk across the room and they just said, this is about the Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, I mean, just means it's in that order of magnitude. So people walking. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, stars are typically moving, like when they're rotating um, about the center of gravity, uh, like tens or, you know, from tens to like thousands of kilometers per second. So it's very easy to detect this shape. Kilometers per second? Yeah. Oh, per second. Yeah, no, no, this is not in a car. Can I make that speed? And then I think like 650 miles per hour. Anyways, um, so I'm, I'm going to. Uh, I guess create the assignment for the second new research project. Um, I'm going to do that tonight. I still have not decided on the papers, so I'll try to pick them up, upload them by tomorrow. But for the uh, computational assignment, it's going to be with some other code from, um, from Bob, from the Big Orange book. And it is for the two stars. So the assignment is to simulate those two graphs that I was in so the, the radial velocity and the, the light velocity. Um, should be easy. Questions about anything else? Homework, uh, assignments? No? Okay, good. Let's go home then. <laughs>